capital funding India's USD 5 trillion economy. Ravi, again. Uh, would you would you announce when do we have to uh, when? Yes, so we would be starting with the announcement. Okay. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, for realizing the dream of an inspired and Atmanirbhar Bharat, adequate and continuous supply of capital needs to be ensured. We welcome you to a discussion on how India's financing needs can be met. It is our honor to welcome Mr. Mark Machin, President and CEO, Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, to this forum. We are eager to hear Mr. Machin's insights on realizing India's vision of becoming a $5 trillion economy. This would be followed by a discussion amongst leading experts from the financial sector. We are indeed pleased to welcome Mr. Rashesh Shah, past President Fiki, and Chairman and CEO, Edelweiss Group, Mr. Ashwini Bhatia, Managing Director, State Bank of India, Mr. Bhargav Das Gupta, Chairman Fiki National Committee on Insurance and Managing Director and CEO ICICI Lombard General Insurance, Mr. Michael Fernandez, Partner Leapfrog Investments, Mr. Sanjay Nair, Partner and CEO KKR India, and Mr. Sunil Sanghai, Chairman Fiki National Committee on Capital Markets and founder and CEO, Nova Dhruva Capital Private Limited. I request Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, President Fiki, to deliver the welcome remarks. Good evening and namaste. A warm welcome to what is the last session for the day and what could be a wrap up of a productive day. What could be better than discussing financing India's US $5 trillion economy? We started off with uh, Peter Diamond is talking about abundance. We went on to look at artificial intelligence. We spoke about federalism and how the states and the government have to work together. We were inspired by the powerful address of our prime minister and the day has proceeded on to this very important session after we discussed the building blocks of the Indian economy, the COVID and the health crisis, multiple other discussions. But moving on. <coughs> The pre-COVID-19 fiscal year 2020, investment was 33% of GDP. If India is to meet the challenge of accelerating GDP and productivity, growth and large-scale job creation, investment will need to rise to about 37% of GDP. This implies the need to raise capital of almost 2.4 trillion in the fiscal year uh, 2030 and 1.5 trillion in 2025 compared to about 865 billion in the year 2020. In the corporate sector, small and medium-sized companies will have to grow in size and increase their share in capital formation substantially. All this is extracted from McKinsey's report, which was presented to us just yesterday. Boosting investment would require reforms in three areas. Number one, getting a higher share of household savings to flow into financial products, especially the capital markets. Number two, the cost of financial intermediation needs to come down so that uh, firms become, it becomes more competitive to borrow. And three, public finances should be improved through rationalization of government consumption. 
On channeling more household savings into capital markets, we've seen a number of suggestions. Uh, first, is there a need to reverse the falling trend in household financial savings and push it up from 6.6% of GDP to 11%? Second, we need reforms to deepen the capital market. And third, insurance and pension products with clarity and simplicity in design. The insurance sector FTI cap should be revised upwards to allow a higher threshold. And fourth, the bond market should be deepened by charging uniform stamp duties on debentures across states. Fifth, more risk capital investment vehicles like private equity. For example, India has about 100 private equity firms, while the United States has 7.5 times the GDP. It has 33 times the number uh, of venture capital funds. These and many, many other topics whether we need a DFI, Development Finance Institution, how do we fund the large-scale infrastructure we require, all these are best to be answered by our experts. But there's one last thing. India also has a foreign exchange reserve of approximately $20 billion. So would this be one of the important levers in helping boost up uh, our financial system? I'm not going to say much more because the experts are really sitting right here with us. But before we move into a powerful panel discussion, which will be moderated by uh, Mr. Rashesh Shah, past president Fiki, and chairman and CEO of Edelweiss Group, I would like to first call upon a very, very important person who we're extremely happy uh, is with us today, and that is Mr. Mark Mashin. President of the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board, uh, Mark has really made a mark in many, many ways in the financial field. And he is here to help us speak about the options that we need to explore. Mark has been constantly engaging with India, and I believe he even had a recent uh, interaction with the Honorable Prime Minister. CPPIB opened up its India office in 2015 and is one of the earliest and the most prominent pension funds in, invested here. I welcome Mark to FIKI's 93rd annual convention. Thank you so much for joining, Mark. And I must say, I'm particularly happy to note that you're a medical doctor by training. And we look forward to a prescription for a healthy and a growing Indian economy. We also have with us some of the most experienced professionals from all over, Sanjay, Michael, uh, many of you, Ashwini, um, Bhargav Das Gupta, all of you who I have known and you know, many of you had the opportunity to interact with. It's a pleasure to be warmly welcoming you for this session. Believe me, we need your gyan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, ma'am, for your opening remarks and for setting the tone for the discussions to follow. May I now request Mr. Mark Machin, President and CEO, Canada Pension Plan Investment Board to deliver the keynote address. Terrific. Well, thank you, Dr. Reddy, for the warm welcome and for inviting me here to be part of Vicky's annual gathering of business leaders. Good afternoon to everybody, and I'm thrilled to be joining you. Some of you may wonder why a Canadian pension fund is interested in India? Well, I'll give you 20 million reasons why. You see 20 million people in Canada, working and retired people, rely on us at CPPIB to invest the Canada pension plan to deliver maximum returns without undue risk of loss. And this helps to ensure their financial security in retirement today and for decades in the future. This is the reason why we invest in India. India is one of the world's top performing emerging economies over the past three decades and is on track for that $5 trillion number for the economy in the next few years. So we've made an active decision to invest in India. Today, I'll provide a short overview of CPPIB or CPP investments, our global investing strategy and our investments in India. 
Second, I'll share our experience working with local partners and governments in India and how the Indian business environment has and continues to advance. And finally, I'll provide some of my thoughts on the long-term investment opportunities post-COVID and why India is very well positioned to succeed. CPP Investments is a global investment management firm that invests the Canada Pension Plan, the largest pension fund in Canada by a significant margin, and is the only Canadian fund that is amongst the top 10 funds in the world. We were created 21 years ago as a dedicated, completely arm's length from politics, professional investment management firm to invest the money that's not immediately needed to pay benefits for the Canada Pension Plan. Over the last 21 years, we've built a global investing organization with over 1,800 professionals in nine offices around the world with over 26 different investing strategies spanning both public and private markets. Today, 85% of our investments are outside of Canada, and almost 30% of the fund is invested in the Asia Pacific. We're active investors, we have patient capital, and we have a very long investment horizon. Our portfolio as of September the 30th this year was about $456.7 billion, or approximately 24 lakh crore, and is invested in a wide range of asset classes and geographies around the world. We will grow, we'll continue to grow, and we expect to be a trillion dollar fund in the early 2030s, and will continue to grow for the decades beyond that. By 2025, we will have approximately one third of the fund invested in emerging markets. And they are primarily in India, in China, and in Brazil. By that time, that portion of the fund, that one third of the fund, will be well over $200 billion. So India is critical to our investment strategy. Currently, we only have about $10.6 billion or 57,000 crore invested in India. So we have huge room for growth. We began investing in India over a decade ago, and we have a full office on the ground in Mumbai. Having people in the markets with deep knowledge, as well as strong Indian partners, has been a large part of our growth and success in the market. We're committed to India, its growth potential, and its openness to long-term capital. And our investments in India span a wide range of asset classes and sectors, including infrastructure, renewable energy, real estate, public equities, direct private equities, and private equity funds, and credit. We see domestic consumption, technology, and the massive demand for infrastructure as important factors underpinning many of the themes and investment opportunities we look at in India. In addition, some of the current credit issues in the financial services industry, which have been exacerbated by the pandemic's impact on the economy, have presented some compelling investment opportunities for providers of long-term stable capital to finance India's next growth cycle. We see huge investment opportunities to fuel India's future, the drive for urbanization, mobility, innovation, and sustainable solutions to improve the quality of life all present significant investment opportunities. And we're far from alone in this observation. Foreign capital has increasingly been attracted to India. Despite COVID, India has surged ahead of most emerging markets in terms of foreign portfolio equity inflows in the last 12 months. In fact, November set an all-time monthly high of, of 8 billion US dollars of equity purchases by foreigners 
And India also jumped to the ninth spot last year, up from 12th spot in the list of top, top 20 recipients of the FDI, according to the World Investment Report. This rising interest in India is a clear indication of the opportunities for future growth and prosperity. As investors, we're pleased to see the numerous initiatives that the government of India is taking to attract patient foreign capital. We welcome the government's comprehensive multi-year strategy for the development of modern infrastructure under the National Infrastructure Pipeline. Infrastructure, including renewables, is a critical part of our investment strategy in India. We have major long-term investments in toll roads, in renewable energy, in logistics, and in financial services. Our investments in Renew Power, one of India's leading clean energy companies with approximately 10 gigawatts of capacity, is helping India reach its goal of installing 175 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by the year 2022. We appreciate the government of India's efforts to attract long-term capital in the infrastructure sector, particularly with the provision of the special tax exemption for infrastructure investments, for qualifying pension funds and sovereign wealth funds. There are concerns about the sanctity of contracts and the stability of regulatory and tax frameworks. And we're pleased to see the government is engaged in actively addressing these concerns. REITs and INVITs are relatively new constructs, but they've matured and multiplied in the past few years, attracting a wider pool of institutional investors. Now let me turn to the economic crisis sparked by COVID-19 that is impacting economies around the world. It's uncertain whether there will be lasting impacts or whether they will be just short-lived. Global shifts were already in motion before the pandemic emerged. The acceleration of technology, the shift of economic growth from west to east, urbanization, shifting supply chains, and the significant demographic changes. These were all underway. With COVID-19, we're now seeing these shifts accelerate. We are years ahead of where we thought we would be in some of these trends. The acceleration of e-commerce, fintech, e-learning, telehealth, and other technology-enabled solutions are rapidly moving us closer to the future. Some of these shifts will definitely be permanent. And India is really well positioned to benefit from these new opportunities. With more than 800 million internet users and over 200 million online shoppers, India's share of the world's technology successes will only rise. Our investments in education technology company Baiju's, India's second most valuable startup, and global IT and services companies like Batuza and Hexaware are examples of our involvement in India's success in this area. Another major trend we are seeing accelerate post-COVID is changing supply chains. Global supply chains are likely to, be to become more, not less complex. Two significant investments in this space in India include delivery, a leading provider of third-party logistics, and Indospace, which develops modern logistics facilities. There are also huge infrastructure opportunities that underpin India's growing integration in global supply chains, including ports, airports, and inland container depots. Private investment in transport infrastructure can boost India's attractiveness as a manufacturing hub and build more resilient supply chains. India's favorable demographics are also a reason for international manufacturers to consider investing in onshore operations to serve the, the, the huge domestic market. It's clear India has the opportunity 
in the post-pandemic recovery to be one of the world's top performing economies. The growth momentum and the long-term trends strengthen the country's attractiveness. We believe India is an important market for our long-term investments and look forward to continuing to participate in its success. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Machin, for your keynote address. Some of our esteemed members have a few comments and questions for Mr. Machin. May I first request Mr. Y.K. Modi, past President Fiki, to kindly share his thoughts. Thank you. <clears throat> Mark, it was a very good presentation by you. Uh, I'm just going to want to take your advice to the government, to the regulators, and to some of the corporates, especially medium-scale corporates, to raise uh, capital, both debt and equity. Yesterday's presentation by McKenzie, which uh, the president also referred, showed that India is lagging behind maximum in number of medium-scale companies. So we want medium scale to go to large and small to become medium. So in that respect, even investment grade companies find it difficult of this size to attract capital, both risk capital and debt capital. So what would be your suggestion to Indian companies and regulators and government how to get over this problem? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think th this is a challenge, not just in India, but in many countries of how to channel capital in an efficient way to that growing middle. Uh, there's often a thriving, sort of very early startup phase for capital, and there's often abundant capital for the giant blue chip groups. The challenge is that middle. And one of the, one of the ways of achieving that is to ensure that there are there's a thriving market for specialists in that area so funds that tackle that area and whatever incentives and structures and uh and, and other infrastructure that's required to develop that whether it's through uh you know through the the non-bank financial sector which is obviously quite is, is struggling right now, whether it's uh, directing uh, more bank capital in that direction, or whether it's uh, encouraging uh, the, the flourishing of growth at the private equity funds uh, that are focused in that area. But there's some of the things that uh, many countries do. I think from our point of view, given, you know, we are 1800 people, we cover the whole world, we can't have uh, we can't have a huge team running around covering smaller and mid-cap companies in India. So we will always do it with local partners. We'll look at people, maybe some on the screen here, who have funds, who have capability of, of, of going through all of those companies. So we, we will definitely look to deploy capital, but we'll work with local partners to look for those companies. The final thing I'd say is the efforts to strengthen corporate governance are really are really welcome because one of the challenges for the small and mid-sized companies historically has been governance. So I think a lot of the efforts that have been underway to strengthen corporate governance uh, in India have been really, really welcome because then that means you can have more confidence to deploy the capital to those companies. Sunil, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Mark, that was very comprehensive present presentation. I've got a couple of thoughts going in my mind, and that's on the basis of uh, amount of uh, experience you have about India. Uh, you have spent a lot of time here and in the region. Um, so, couple of thoughts, and you pick and choose if you like to answer some of them. First 
you spend a lot of time with the government. Uh, you did indicate, uh, and we all know, as President indicated, that you participated in the roundtable, which was hosted by the Prime Minister. Uh, so, would you like to share? We are not asking for any non-public information, but anything which any learning from that interaction with the Prime Minister uh, and and his team. Uh, that's one. Number two. Uh, you, you have spent a lot of time in China. You continue to spend a lot of time in China. And you did mention that part of your emerging market investment is going to go towards China. I know at Goldman Sachs also you spend a lot of time in China. So uh, any learning from your uh, knowledge experience of China, which we can try and, and uh, take it here in India. And the third and the final point, um, as President, President also mentioned, there is often a debate uh, that our reserve, foreign exchange reserve with the central bank is almost touching now half a trillion dollars. Uh, any thoughts on how to be used that reserve? Uh, there, there is a debate whether some part of that can be deployed in, in infrastructure. Uh, any thoughts on that will be helpful. Okay, excellent. That, that's, uh, that's a lot of uh, questions that I could spend the next hour giving answers on. So let, let me try and give some very quick perspectives on them. On the, the, the Prime Minister and uh, the, uh, the, the virtual global investor roundtables that uh, he hosted with a range of the senior cabinet, senior government officials, these are really impressive. The, the facts that India, from the most senior level, is reaching out in a coordinated way across government and private sector and engaging with the top long-term pools of capital in the world it is really impressive. And to do that at a time that India is fighting a global pandemic is extraordinarily impressive. The, so just, just the fact of doing it was excellent. Uh, secondly, I think this administration, this government has been listening carefully to what investors like us want. So when they talk back about some of the initiatives and plans they have in place, it, it's almost music to our ears because they listen very carefully and they're putting in place the right incentives, the right stability, uh, the right predictability, the right scale, the right organization uh, of, uh, of, of processes uh, that, is, uh, you know, that, that is really exciting, including basic things like single points of contact uh, for, for global investors. So all, all of these things will facilitate investors like us taking India even more seriously and being, having the confidence to deploy more capital to the country to fuel the fuel the economy. So I, it, it is uh, it, it really is quite uh, quite quite laudable that the government's been doing this. I think on the question of China, it's very difficult very difficult to say. As you all know, China is is very very different in its governance system uh, and. You know, for it's sometimes very beguiling for people who are in business to go there, and you know, because you can build a high-speed railway or a road in the blink of an eye, it's very uh, it's very attractive to people who uh, see that 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 can be done so quickly uh, when when you're doing it in democratic countries and democratic. Uh, constituencies is much harder because you have to negotiate and deal with uh, you know, deal with people's uh, people's interests. So I, it's difficult to simplistically take lessons from China. I think one of the things that all countries should aim for is the long term planning, which is so challenging in uh, you know, in, in countries where you have to deal with election cycles, you know, local elections, you know, uh, state elections, federal elections, etc. But that long term planning, strategic planning, I think has, uh, you know, has 
worked well, but balancing it, you know, the, the, the lesson that China took away from the Soviet Union was central planning doesn't work. Uh, and I think India years ago has learned this lesson as well, that central planning is not that, not that effective. But if you can combine long-term strategic thinking with capital markets and the deployment of capital in an efficient way through the economy, uh, so you allow the private sector and you allow the capital markets to function well, then, then that, that works much better. So that's what they've been trying to do is to try and get that balance between uh, long-term strategic planning and vision and having a thriving capital market that actually deploys the capital effectively. And, you know, the jury will always be out whether they've got the balance right. And, you know, people, I think, can be rightly critical in a number of aspects. But, the, uh, but that, that's, that it's certainly better than the Soviet Union. Um, in terms of the foreign exchange reserves of India and how they might be deployed, look, I, I'm not sure I'm going to give really granular advice on that. Clearly, foreign exchange reserves are really important, particularly in a country where historically foreign exchange yeah. risk has been a significant vulnerability. So you don't want to do things with those reserves that impair those reserves. Having said that, I think some of the ways that the government is thoughtfully crowding in foreign capital alongside its own capital into long-term investment is very thoughtful. I think the NIIF, which we're an investor in, so far has been a terrific success and has been really well run. One of the challenges in most countries of crowding private capital alongside government is a divergence of interests some point down the road where government wants to do something with that capital that the private investors don't think is a, is a good use of that capital. And I think so far this has been structured and deployed in a way that is that, that balances all interests and results in good risk-adjusted returns for the investors like us uh, and also provides uh, scaled up capital for deployment alongside the government's capital. So it's a rare success in the world of putting private and public capital alongside each other in, in a successful format and targeting at it at a part of investment that creates this huge multiplier effect, i.e. infrastructure. So I, that, that's the one example, and I'm sure they'll if there are other vehicles like that that could be managed in this way, where they are managed professionally, where they're managed with investment returns uh, as, a, as a key uh, priority, but also lever off government capital, that, that, that could be, there could be some other interesting vehicles there. That was brilliant. That was Touched on all the three questions. Uh, I know this is early in the morning for you, so I'll just do a quick, um, formal vote of thanks, um, and, and then we'll let you go, Mark, and we'll start with a panel discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we take this opportunity to thank Mr. Mark Machin uh, for being a friend of India, because as he just described, uh, he's a big investor, uh, a significant investor, uh, and across the various asset classes. And also more importantly, uh, the commitment to do more, uh, which is what we need. Uh, we also thank him because of uh, a friend of FIKI uh, for always embracing the events of FIKI. Uh, I know for a few years ago as well, Mark and uh, uh, his team had attended FIKI's event. Uh, today is, is a classic example. Uh, this is a weekend morning for him, early in the morning, and at my first request, he immediately accepted our invitation. Uh, so Mark, thank you for that. Mark, your continued commitment to India gives us confidence when we are targeting $5 trillion economic <clears throat> target, a support from one of the largest global investors like you uh, inspires us. We totally understand, as you mentioned in your speech, that uh, to achieve this kind of target, our financial markets also have to dovetail with the global financial markets, and uh, we are working towards that. 
in the last couple of years, a lot of work happened towards the equity market, bond market, banking sector, securities market. You talked about REITs, INVITs. Uh, we have actually come out with a new framework for International Financial Services Center. Uh, you mentioned NIIF, which is a great experiment and working very well. So with all these initiatives, uh, I'm sure our market uh, will get integ integrated with the global markets. And that would provide more opportunities for uh, global investors like you to really uh, invest in India. Your talk has been really enriching. And I once again thank you, Mark, uh, for your time and support. Thanks very much. Matt, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. It's been a, a huge honor. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, and wonder, wonderful to be here. And I, I wish you great success in the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We're very grateful and look forward to seeing more of you in India. Good. Maybe may now call uh, Mr. Rashid Shah to moderate yeah. the panel. Good evening, Rashid, and welcome. Good evening to you. And, uh, 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 I guess to spend a Saturday evening, you know, deliberating how India gets to the five trillion dollar economy mark, which has been one objective that has inspired and excited all of us. But I'm truly happy that uh, I think we are speaking this after hearing Mark spend time discussing how India can get there, how uh, also seeing it from the eyes of a foreign investor, a large foreign investor in India, which I guess makes all of our jobs easier. And the prospect of COVID vaccine almost on the anvil means that we may now finally, towards the end of 2020, feel that we can put the pandemic behind us and start looking at the future. So what better time than this to revisit India's objective of how do we get to $5 trillion and especially the financing required for this $5 trillion. As you've seen, uh, we have a great panel. Uh, Mr. Bhatia from State Bank, Mr. Fernandes from Leafrog, Bhargav Das Gupta from ICICI Lombard and Sanjay Nayan from KKR. So we have a wide range of experts. It's going to be a very exciting conversation ahead of us. And uh, I do feel that the panel will be able to add a lot more nuance and a lot more color to the issues that we have all been discussing. But before we go to the panel for the views, let me try and set the context. I think first we cannot start any conversation without the global dislocation that has happened because of COVID. It's been an unprecedented disruption. And uh, it's very uh, it's very interesting that we are towards the end of the year, but the whole 2020 has been completely a very different year than what all of us have experienced. And the Indian economy also has been uh, impacted by that. But the Indian economic story has been the two halves the first half of the year and the second half of the year. And the way things went down in the first half, it's been impressive that how fast things have come back in the second half. And partly, I think government of India's timely and decisive action in a very balanced approach. They have focused on saving lives as well as livelihoods. They have not used all the ammunition they have on the fiscal side. They've been very sparing on that. But, allow, but with all of that, and thanks to the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India has been fabulous in this, Indian economy is on an uptick again. And we all realize that this crisis has now become an opportunity for us because we can reset our economy and go towards good and get back to going from current almost $3 trillion to the $5 trillion mark. I think Atmanirbhar Bharat has been a great start the production link and incentive scheme, hopefully we'll get the manufacturing sector going. We need to move the manufacturing for almost about 17, 18% of GDP to at least 20, ideally 25% of GDP. And that's a tall ask, but I think a lot of action that have been initiated, hopefully will take us towards that goal. As we think about India, I think very important to step back 
and see the India's journey up till now. I think India is a very big paradox. I think we all have a lot of issues around that. That India is large and small at the at the same time. We are a three trillion dollar GDP, but we are also a, a two thousand dollar per capita GDP. So we are very small at one level, but very large at another level. We are very stable, but we are also very turbulent. Uh, as you know, as the Vax said that uh, India tries hard to keep both the optimist and the pessimist, both of them happy. So India has been a paradox that we all Indian entrepreneurs, business people, investors, as well as global investors, have tried to grapple with. And today's evening, we will also try and see how to find the balance and how to capitalize on these opportunities. Uh, it appears, look at the last 25 years, the growth has been very stable on a point to point basis. So I think India is the story of the last 25 years, which is 100 quarters. But uh, as I was preparing for this, almost 20 quarters out of this 100 quarters, there has been some really big turbulence or the other. So we really, almost every one, one and a half years, we have some big impact that happens to our economy. And in spite of that, the economy continues to grow. Indian economy has grown by almost 9% in US dollar terms from 92 to now. So, and in that, the financial services industry, which has been the lifeblood of this, has gone through its own periodic ups and downs, NPAs and NBFC crises and uh, slowdown in the economy and the foreign currency falling. In spite of all of that, Financial services has grown by 25 times in 25 years. So it's been a great story as we look at the long term. And earlier, Mark spoke about it, that India needs all of us to take a long term view. So as we get ready for this, there are a lot of initiatives along the way. And we today at the panel discussion would like to talk about how does the banking sector help India get there with all these existing NPA challenge and the reach and the underbanked uh, status of India. How does the bond market and the insurance companies and hopefully the pension funds uh, help out with that? How do the global investors, both in equity markets and credit markets, how do they uh, see the opportunity? Which parts of, the, of India's economy can be funded by them? What is the risk return they expect? How do the private equity investors, especially in technology, how do they see this entire uh, financing India's growth? How they see the, the opportunity and the challenge in that? So I think with that, the need of the hour is to ask the right questions. And I'm very happy that today I have that opportunity with a fabulous panel along with me. So I'll start off with uh, you, Mr. Bhatia. Uh, you are a veteran of the banking industry. Having been at State Bank of India, you've seen the PSU banks evolve and change over the last 30 years. Uh, what would be the two or three key areas that you think banks can do more to increase the credit penetration, to increase banking penetration, and especially bring down individualization cost because one of the strange things we have in India is people who save the money. The depositors, they feel they are not earning enough. The, the deposit rates are not keeping up with inflation. While the people who borrow money, all the corporate borrowers, and we have quite a few of them in this audience today, they constantly feel that interest rates in India are very high. And they both can't be true. And it's I would call it another one of the paradox in India. So what can the banking sector and what is to be done to make sure that we keep the savers and the borrowers happy? And how do we increase the banking reach and penetration in India, especially what can the PSU banks do? What can the government do via PSU banks? Over to you, Mr. Bhatia. So thank you, Rashish. <laughs> Banking, of course, has changed over the last 20, 25 years. You yourself mentioned that, you know, it has grown 25 times over the last 25 years. The nature of banking has changed. The products have changed. The channels have changed. So we at State Bank of India currently, for example, do about 93% of our banking through digital modes. 
and this percentage of course is going to rise in the years to come but talking specifically i mean today we are discussing a 5 trillion dollar economy uh, so the changes that have been brought about over the last 10 years by the government by the regulators i think should give confidence to all uh, all the participants here so from about 27 banks today you have 12 consolidation has happened in a very big way uh, we we i mean absorbed eight banks about 3 years back it happened seamlessly and so is the case with most of the public sector banks. So the structure, of course, has changed entirely. You have good, strong banks in different regions. There are still a few smaller ones. I think uh, something is being talked about at the policy front on their privatization and so on and so forth. We've been reading about that in the papers. For your question, you know, that, uh, you know, why are deposit rates low and why do depositors not get their due uh, the reasons are again very clear today we are flush with liquidity 8 lakh crores is what is lying in reverse repo and other products in state bank of india i can tell you that we can fund so much but the credit deposit ratio has fallen to multi-year lows because the opportunities are not there opportunities are not there because the capacity utilization is 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 not there but you did mention that you had a we had a very difficult first half the second half looks much better we are talking of a v-shaped re re recovery as the economy comes back on its feet the working capital cycle improves I think we are going to see more utilization come in. Growth is going to come. On the advances side, you again mentioned that, you know, the borrowers are borrowing uh, at very high rates. Again, for the top guys, today, good companies can raise two-year money at 4.5%. You haven't seen those rates before. NIMS and NII of NBFCs and banks are again at record highs. So, I don't think anybody should complain over there. Whatever RBI has done has helped. Going back to 5 trillion, you know, we had an initial target of FY 24, 25. Assume that we have a zero year in 2020, 21, and we will have one with negative growth. So, that gets postponed by about a year, year and a half. Are we ready for it? Certainly, you know, uh, today we are a three, almost a $3 trillion economy with a banking sector of about $2 trillion. If you add the mutual funds, if you add the NBFCs, there is a lot of money that is going around that can fund the economy very, very comfortably. There are confident people like uh, Mark Machin who just spoke to us. The opportunity in India, of course, is big. And anybody who thinks long term, whether it was a whether it was a Maruti Suzuki in the 80s or a Honda or whatever, the the demand in the economy is is there. Challenge is that we improve our manufacturing. So Atmanirbhar has helped. The recent scheme on the production linked incentives will again help. None of the countries in the past post industrial re revolution have become great without manufacturing so whether it was england you know in the 19th century or later on germany america of course today exports arms and uh, technology and human capital uh, japan korea china you name any one of these it has to be manufacturing it has to be export driven so whatever we, you are seeing currently that is happening in government and the policy, I think that should lead to a good pickup on that side. Uh, another, another issue, of course, we have lots of changes, changes of government. A lot of the policy is to be implemented at the states. But my experience of the last 25 to 30 years is this, notwithstanding the government, there is a certain trajectory and path as far as the policy is concerned. 
On the finance side, I think we have only improved over the last two years. So I'm, I'm, I'm very confident the banks can fund that. Of course, uh, infrastructure and all, uh, we did burn fingers. Many of the institutions did. So there needs to be some stability on the legal side, on the construction risk, regulatory risk, policy risk, so on and so forth. I think with all the lessons learned, we'll be in a much better shape to fund all these projects in the years to come. Excellent. Excellent, Mr. Bhatti. I think uh, that is very comprehensive and uh, absolutely, as you said, I think the people who can think long term and invest for the long term have done well in India. And we say India is not just a, a five day test match. It's almost like an infinite 20 year test match. And uh, you have to be willing to play, play the 20 year test match rather than a T20, which maybe a few investors try to play and then burn their uh, you know, fingers on that. So absolutely uh, agree with you on that. I think uh, as you also correctly said, I think we need to reduce risk in the economy. We constantly say we need to attract more risk capital, but as we try to attract more risk capital, maybe the other opportunity is to just reduce risk so that whichever capital is there does not ask for the risk premium. But I'll come back to that. Uh, I wanted to go to Bhargav. Uh, we obviously know that the banking sector has done a lot of uh, heavy, you know, uh, the heavy part of the job, especially the bond markets also need to do their job. And I think in India, the equity markets part of the capital markets has done very well. Over the last 25 years, we have really evolved our equity markets. But a bond market, and especially you come from ICICI and now the insurance part of ICICI, you have seen this very closely. Why have the bond markets not really taken off? And what can be done, especially with insurance companies and hopefully pension funds, to really get them that long-term uh, you know, credit available to the Indian economy via the bond markets? Uh, thanks, Rashesh, uh, and thank you, Fiki, for uh, having me uh, on this panel today. Uh, so, uh, you know, Rashesh, as you rightly pointed out, I think we've made tremendous progress on the equity side of the capital market. Um, over the last maybe 10, 15 years, we've seen some progress in the bond market, but clearly not enough. And I, can, I guess all of us uh, see the bond market today is largely an institutional market. Uh, a wholesale market uh, with banks, mutual funds, uh, insurance companies, pension funds as the key player, key players. And in my mind, that's uh, led to uh, certain uh, you know uh, issues that need to be resolved. One is it's a very uh, skewed market, uh, very little retail participation, uh, lack of uh, debt. Uh, the second is that it's a reasonably uh, opaque market. You know, prices are traded bilaterally. Uh, there is no uh, uh, contractual transparency that we see in the equity side of the uh, you know the Apple market, and it's also very shallow. I mean, if you look at let's say from our insurance industry perspective, uh, we are obviously big investors in the bond side, but uh, I mean I can speak for us as ICSA Lombard. Uh, about 85% of our investment is in the bond uh, you know um, you know in bond uh, in the bond market, but uh, our investment in anything below triple A is uh, very very low. Uh, which leads to uh, further uh, challenges for uh, you know some of the points that was earlier raised. Mr. Uh, Vaikya Modi asked about why can't mid-sized corporates or small corporates raise money from uh, from these markets. Uh, so clearly there is not enough investor appetite to invest in uh, you know single A or junk bond uh, you know market segment. Uh, so you know as I said, there's a lot of things that has been done over the past, but. If I look ahead and think about some certain things that we should consider uh, from a policy side, uh, looking at the domestic market, thinking about, let, let's say, us insurance companies as potential investors. Um, one is in terms of uh, creating greater confidence on the risk side uh, in terms of the as we go down the risk curve, uh, there is a lack of confidence in terms of the governance, the credit quality. And there is possibly a, a big role that the recently proposed Credit Guarantee Enhancement Corporation, you know, uh, that can play in terms of uh, giving some amount of credit enhancement support 
to initially promote, let's say, maybe the priority sector corporate bonds, uh, you know, whichever way the government wants to look at promoting certain sectors. Uh, these could become like, the, you know, this entity could become like the Fannie Mae or the Freddie Mac uh, for the, you know, what they did for the housing market in the US. So that's one, you know, possible solution that uh, we see in terms of deepening the, uh, you know, let's say the single A and below, uh, you know, corporate bond market. Second is, and again, we've talked about this uh, for a long, long time, is credit default swaps. Uh, I think this is one segment that has really uh, been instrumental in promoting uh, participation on of uh, long term uh, investors in uh, some of the sub you know lower rated uh, you know markets and in india that's possibly something that we need to focus on in terms of creating liquidity uh, one uh, you know policy consideration that we could look at is uh, creating a uh, you know for for rbi to consider repo and in investment grade corporate bonds uh, it will create i mean there is a lot more liquidity in that segment but it will create liquidity in the events of crisis we've seen sudden dislocation in the bond market in uh, uh, whenever there is, uh, let's say in, in, in the month of March, we saw some, you know, very high quality AAA corporate bonds trading at extremely high, you know, uh, rates. Those dislocations can be addressed if there is, uh, you know, this uh, window that gets opened up. Uh, one of the recent initiatives by SEBI and uh, IRD, which is our regulator, uh, which we believe is a very, you know, important, uh, you know, step in terms of creating more transparency. Uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, on the pricing of the bond market is the RFQ platform for quotes and dealing in corporate bonds. You know, when you look at equity, all of us understand the transparency of pricing and the and the certainty of contracts. But as I said, the bond market is largely a bilateral uh, market when in terms of price discovery. You know, what IRD and SEBI has encouraged, which is to start with 10% of the uh, total secondary market trades of corporate bonds through RFQ, uh, will be a good, uh, you know, we believe a good start to gradually, uh, you know, bring in more transparency in the sector. The other point that I will make from the domestic investor side is uh, retail participation. Uh, we all understand the retail participation today is channelized through the mutual fund, uh, you know, the credit funds. Uh, but there is clearly a possibility of allowing a lot more participation of the retail of retail investors. And one of the things that could be done is, uh, you know, similar to, you know, tax breaks in fixed deposits that's given for fixed deposit in banks. A similar number of similar similar amount of tax break for investment in the corporate bond market, uh, but one of the things that clearly would need to be done before that is a lot of uh, focus on investor awareness. Uh, I don't think retail investors really understand the nuances of the uh, corporate bond market at the level that they need to. But these are journeys that we need to take and start with uh, to build up build more resilience and depth uh, in the in the bond market. And similarly, there is a lot of uh, money which we believe uh, can be attracted from. Uh, you know, funds across the world. I mean, we I talked about, uh, you know, uh, allowing CVSs in the market. We could allow international investors to to come in as writers of CVS contract, for example, if the market is not deep enough in the, you know, from the Indian side, we could allow some of those things. The other aspect that we keep hearing is the, uh, on the investing in the corporate bond side, uh, clearly, you know, the uh, fully accessible route needs to be opened up. Uh, as it was done for government securities, because some of these uh, would help in uh, allowing these uh, asset classes, uh, you know, entry into the global bond indices. And these indices require securities, uh, uh, including the, to be included in the index, uh, not to have any trading restrictions. So these are some of the thoughts that I had, which I wanted to share. Uh, but clearly, as you rightly said, uh, there is a huge need. And if you want to achieve the $5 trillion economy within the time frames that uh, Prime Minister has set for our, us, uh, we need a very, very vibrant bond market uh, to promote, uh, you know, the kind of investments that we need and fund the risk, uh, you know, uh, provide the capital that, uh, you know, uh, promoters would need to set up capacity in India. Yeah, excellent, Bhargav. Uh, thanks for this. I'm very happy you gave that example of coordination between SEBI and IRDA because uh, one of the aspects we have seen in my Markets got developed in India because partly it was only the purview of only one regulator, only structure and the rules for the market. But bond market is will require coordination between RBI, SEBI, and IRDA because I think the uh, the bond market will impact all the players in all these three uh, parts of the Indian financial sector. So hence the bond market requires much larger coordination. And the example that you gave is actually very encouraging. 
coming to you, Sanjay, I think, uh, Sanjay, you have seen all sides of the of the equation. You've been a banker. You were heading Citibank in India. Uh, now with KKR, you have done private equity. You have done private credit. You have done infrastructure. So I think uh, we can ask some uh, really complicated questions around this to you. As we look at India, we really need long-term capital, really long-term patient risk-bearing capital in India. And uh, a lot of foreign investors are interested, though even now the numbers are not as large. India needs a lot of investments. We need uh, approximately about a trillion dollars of investment. As the president said, you know, 34% of $3 trillion means our investment rate has to be about a trillion dollars a year, which requires about 500 billion of equity and 500 billion of credit. So we are short on all sides. We are short on equity, we are short on credit. Foreigners can play a big role in especially getting long-term uh, equity as well as credit capital to India. But unfortunately, the returns that they ask for, everybody feels the risk premium that foreigners ask when they invest either via private equity or private credit in India is too high because there are a lot of opportunities in India. And why shouldn't foreigners where the global interest rates are so low and we are looking at negative interest rates, why should there not be a lot of capital available to India with returns at about 8 9% and not higher than that? Well, what is your thought yeah, on that? How do we bring that up? Rasesh, I have a pretty different view. I think we cannot build an economy on just foreign capital. I've been saying this for a very long time. And adding this Atman Nirbhar stuff, I think you have to be absolutely clear. You've got to build local pools of capital. So my view is the foreign capital will come at a reasonable price when there is an Indian capital market alternative with your local savings. Now, I think with what Bhargav said, I think that is one very big area of development that the regulators need to sit around the table, remove the idiosyncrasies between different regulators and get the local pools of capital that are huge in insurance, pension, savings accounts into the real sector. Now, that may or may not suit everyone because you run a very large fiscal deficit and obviously you use the local savings that's why insurance companies have to have so much of triple a because you have to finance the government bonds first but look at some point the fiscal math will work out you have to therefore develop rasesh point number one the large local pools of capital to be intermediated in the local markets through a very very robust corporate bond market and one of the most important criteria for that is a bankruptcy code, which we have. Yes, yet to stabilize, but I think we have the basic building blocks of that. We have great platforms for settlement like the equity markets. That is priority number one. Unless you can establish the right risk reward and the right pricing, where the local capital will come in, the foreign capital can demand 18%, 16%. How does it matter, right? But the answer is not in getting foreign capital. The second thing is you've got to have a, a really robust non-bank finance market that is able to package loans, package mortgages, uh, package bonds, and sell them. Again, back to the secondary bond market where there are actual buyers for different kinds of paper. Okay, balance sheets don't have to always grow. They have to underwrite, they have to warehouse, they have to sell. Nowhere in the world do you just grow on the basis of AUM and put more equity and more AUM. Third, I think the government can play an important role by having uh, some very unique and very focused sovereign funds that can catalyze local sovereign fund again local money local sovereign fund that can catalyze foreign capital to come behind it i think nif is a great example a few more of those uh, targeted towards smes msmes equity debt uh, are, are absolutely absolutely critical and final i think we have a great innovation in things like REITs, inwits and aif india has done a fantastic job now we just got to cultivate these markets have less and less intermediation and friction cost and really let these three instruments grow. And you know what I mean by intermediation cost and changing regulations. Smooth flowing, take some risk, come into and let the retail these. That is when you begin to have a real robust local capital market. Equities are pretty good. I'm not saying they are very wide and deep, but they are much better. The bond markets of this kind need to get developed. 
and leave it to the issuers, and leave it to the fund managers and leave it to the investors. Yes, you have all kinds of disclosures and do all that the right way. But unless you develop that, Rasesh, actually your question to me actually scares me. If you just depend upon a five trillion economy being built by foreign capital, I would really worry, worry about it. And more so in the debt market, then you in a way are dollarizing your deficit and that's not a great idea. So that's my short and simple answer to you. Great, I'm happy you spoke about the SME. Uh, coming to you, uh, you Michael, I think we spoke about this. How do we fund the, you know, the center part of the economy, the middle part, not the large companies, not the very small ones, but the middle part of the economy, both from an equity and from credit point of view. And uh, of late, technology has been a big enabler, also for underwriting, for analytics, for even uh, you know delivering credit to the uh, to SMEs in India. Uh, given your experience, how do you see us doing a lot more in making sure the capital, the right capital, is available to the uh, to the MSMEs in India? Thank you, Rafesh, for that. Um... It's, it's been the million, billion, now it seems to be the trillion dollar question for India, right? How do you unlock the flow to that second tier, which uh, banks struggle to lend to, just given the, the number of them, the underwriting challenges, the small size of the loans, given the size of the banks, which the large institutional pools of capital struggle to bring money towards the insurance companies because of the rating requirements uh, do struggle to bring money into that segment and clearly uh, the retail market does not serve because again lack of knowledge inability to really understand the risk right? so, so this has remained uh, an enormous challenge i think there's a couple of elements which are playing out to india's advantage i was actually on a call with the Singapore MAS some time back, you know, sort of explaining to them that some of the work which um, the Indian government and regulator has done in creating a lot more information, digital information, to enable higher quality underwriting of um, smaller players. Just the first, of course, was the entire Aadhaar database, which really allowed a lot of retail lending to begin to happen. Uh, you've now got the GST databases, which is beginning to create a lot more transparency of information. Right? And a lot of these are beginning to get accessible by the non-bank finance companies who could leverage technology and other means to support that underwriting. The challenge is still, to be honest, the entire package is still not there. The package is still not there in a couple of areas. Uh, digital data, on, you know, asset registries actually making sure that all assets can be tracked very quickly, underwritten using data, whether it's a real estate asset or a uh, movable, movable asset. The quality of those registries, the digital linkages of that with lenders remains quite poor across the country. So if you were trying to do a, a loan, a highly disintermediated loan to someone to buy, for him to buy a house, it's very difficult to pull that off digitally today and you are actually therefore depending upon local intermediaries stepping in to provide that financing and the cost of that begins to go up their ability to bring balance sheet behind that loan is much more challenging and uh, their ability to then package and sell on that loan is also more challenging because there's just so many intermediate steps in that process so once we're able to link up not just people digitally, but also have a really high quality asset register, which is available nationally, you begin to reduce some of those boundaries. You also have a significant challenge in my mind, and I think uh, Sanjay mentioned this around uh, the NBFC space itself, right? The NBFCs are some of the companies best set up to drive some of this innovation, especially with the SME sector, the individual borrowers with small with small borrowers, uh, whether it's the small partnerships or um, small enterprises, and especially support cash flow based lending, not just asset based lending. And a lot of the SMEs today, especially the high employment generating SMEs, are not necessarily very asset intensive. They are in the services space, they are cash flow driven. But the NBSE sector continues to be in a little bit of a 
no man's no man's land and they are increasingly in fact what has happened over the last two years increasingly dependent only on bank capital their access to other sources of capital have reduced uh, their rating their confidence in their rating has reduced so some of their bigger sources uh, refuse to lend to them the mutual fund industry has been hit by a number of significant defaults and has withdrawn from the space so today i mean and to be honest i think the rbi and the public sector banks have done a great job in trying to step in and make keep that uh, keep that group of companies going uh, but the confidence around their stability has been has been an area which has been a much more shock uh, and they are some of the biggest players in the space unlocking this market really requires um, confidence in long term stability of the nbfc space that they have a space in the market they have a role here's how the regulations for them will evolve here's the confidence we have that 5 years 10 years 20 years later we see them as a long term player uh, and i think the significant reduction in that in the last 2 years uh, simply because of the level of stress the market has seen and the defaults the market has seen around that space has reduced that confidence so that needs to get rebuilt and when that gets rebuilt they leveraging technology being able to create the product services do the underwriting package them sell them on to the bank sell them to the insurance companies will really begin to unlock enormous liquidity for the sme industries in india uh, but i do think it will need to be that combination of, of of actions happening around that the digital registrars on the asset side to back up the stuff not to done on the people side as well as actually ensuring the nbfcs have a cohesive regulatory framework so those would be my in, in my mind the two big areas i mean the third area which i think the government's been working on is just increasing the amount of digitization of cash right so we've moved significantly towards that i do think in the sme space there remains a little bit of a uh, i would dearly say still a bit of a split personality while they increasingly using digital payments they've not yet been encouraged to move nearly 100% to digital payments right and Uh, the impact of that is twofold you have a lot of customers who are getting digital inflows of cash who are then withdrawing the cash to to work with SMEs and MSMEs and uh, you basically continue to have a bit of a shadow economy and if there's an ability to create strong enough incentives including frankly the credit guarantee scheme saying we will underwrite anyone who has digital cash flow we will guarantee their loan so if you lend to someone who's basically taking a loan against his digital cash flow we don't care if it's secured or unsecured we will underwrite that right so immediately it begins to raise the value of having digital cash flow for the sme and msm sector because they can then get working capital underwriting against that or other such initiatives by the government uh, the incentive to move cashless will improve significantly in that space and once that happens the entire ecosystem behind that will improve uh, so i think but the the government's been doing work in that area and that will continue to improve up sure excellent uh i think we are running out of time but there is a little bit of time let me try and squeeze in a couple of last questions uh to you mr bhatia uh, i think we have all spoken about how do we fund infrastructure long term project financing in india i know it's been an ongoing issue i started my career in ICICI 30 years ago and it was the same issue is how do we fund we had ICICI ID development fund but they had their own liability challenges on how to get long term liabilities uh what would you your thoughts be has the time come to the liabilities from will it have to come from government RBI or from uh, you know bank thanks like think, state bank of india i i missed out something in your question but let me go back to your previous question uh, all these analytical models technology based models can do so much very frankly it is the person on the ground you know who is there to assess the the small uh, corporate the small msme to take his case forward so the recent uh, you know guidelines on co lending co origination and all 
should go a very, very long way in uh, helping us. Uh, again, on, on the same question, you know, there is, there was, there's this book called Other People's Money by John Kay. And he actually mentions that, you know, uh, the, the branch manager is the pillar of society. So, you know, I would think that, you know, you still need to have a brick and mortar kind of a, a model. It's that guy, you know, who understands the environment, the businessman, the corporate nearby, and the growth will happen actually there. Building credit models takes a lot of time. And to have something perfect, I don't think there is any model yet. So I think the, the latest guidelines are, you know, a step in the right direction. I was in mutual fund, uh, you know, for a couple of years. And, you know, the period between April and June this year was a nightmare for us. A couple of defaults and the credit uh, risk funds had a torrid time. And, you know, for no reason, but just panic and nothing else. So we do need, you know, a very, very well-developed bond market for sure. But at the same time, let me also tell you that uh, the banks can't take equity risk. That's for sure. You know, banks uh, actually these days, they come in and it's, you know, banks a loan will get, so it's like, you are taking a venture capitalist's risk or a private equity's risk and uh, there is then nothing to fall back upon on default. So I would like to answer your question on liabilities. I didn't get it clearly, actually. No, the, the question I had, maybe I can I can toss it to Bhargav. Uh, the question I had, Mr. Bhatia, was uh, has the time come to relook at setting up development financial institutions in India? We had ICICI, IDVI many years ago. I mean, I, I just had referred that I had started my career out there. And uh, the, the question is always where the funding So, so my, my short answer would, my short comes answer from, would be yes. And uh, I can also do so the same. No, yeah, so, please so go ahead. The question can go back to Bhargav. My short answer to that would be yes. State Bank of India was a working capital, uh, you know, uh, bank in the 80s, in, in the 90s. We were pretty much the gold standard. Or if ICICI, IDBI and others, we get a complete project and then we move on from there. We would love to have DFIs back into the, into the arena. So, uh, so has the time come for that, Bargo? And how will the liabilities work? Where will be the liabilities, the long-term liabilities for this did, uh, you know, DFIs come from? Yeah, so, uh, uh, Rashish, you remember those days, right? Pre-91, you were there in ICICI. We, you know, we saw what the way the model worked. Um, and uh, at times, we forget the lessons of history. So, you know, for everyone's benefit, let me recount what used to happen. Uh, this was a controlled economy. Uh, it was a producer's market. If uh, India needed 100,000 vehicles, the license would be given to companies to pro pro uh, produce 80,000 vehicles. We would borrow money uh, for the borrowing. We used to get some amount of support from the government as DFIs. Uh, our cost of borrowing was maybe about 9-10% at that time. The lending rate was about 15-16%. So there was a rich 5-6% NIM that DFIs used to uh, make in an environment which was where the competitive intensity was much less. Uh, so you didn't see global competition for to Indian, Indian industry and you had a 5-6% margin. So the model worked. I don't understand this, uh, you know, nostalgia for that model that we keep having where every 10 years we talk about the DFI solving all problems. From from that time in 1991, we've had, in 97, we had one uh, DFI idea promoted. In 2006, we had another DFI uh, idea promoted. Uh, I don't think it solved the problem. Having said that, then we are to, again talking about that model. If we have to uh, do the model, we probably have to take some of the learnings of the past in terms of why it worked. Again, you know, to share... You know, this background was to talk about how the financing has to work, as you rightly said. Uh, you know, I'm saying if you have to do it, uh, because any little bit of help to help the uh, infrastructure financing grow, uh, I think we should consider it. But um, clearly from the, you know, structuring of that entity, um, there's a big, big debate whether it's a, it should be a government company or a private company. It probably could be a 49% uh, a PPP kind of company with a 49% from the government, 51 from, you know, all the institutions of 
repute uh, like sbi you know all you know various others uh, you know could uh, could chip in and participate but the funding is key and there uh, you cannot uh, build infrastructure project with the kind of cost of funding that you end up having in india for long term uh, you know uh, you know bonds etc so some amount of government support maybe they have to be qualified as an slr bond to get money at a low rate uh, and you know and and then only this institution can poss- possibly uh, you know provide uh, you know stable viable you know lower cost uh, you know money to uh, infrastructure projects and one last point is that finally you have to solve the core problem if you look at what happened in the last 7 8 years it is the sanctity of contracts it is the time taken to get approvals for environment clearance it is the time taken to get approvals for by buying land uh, and once you uh, once you get all of that uh, policy certainty i think all of us understand these issues uh, unless these issues get solved the underlying model whether it's a dfi model or you know capital market model or you know bank model none of this will work yeah i think it's a non going uh, it's a non going issue i think uh, on the asset side we continue to to bring the on on the and trying to do intermediation as efficiently as we can there's a long way to go on that and uh, i do believe that a lot of the challenges are not so much is a credit risk but a lot of challenges are alm risk because we really need long term stable funding that is available and hence and only with that can a lot of funding in india can get solved so i think unfortunately we have been over running on time because of uh, this exciting conversation we can go on and on but i have been just told that uh, we need to end that so thank you to all my fellow panelists thank you for this and i'll just hand it over to sunil for the uh, for the vote of thanks and the closing remarks over to you sunil thank you rashesh and i know we a little bit over and some of you have to leave so i'll be very brief three quick points which i wanted to make and i really enjoyed this discussion and debate because i do feel exactly the same way i think there are two models worldwide uh, to fund any kind of this kind of growth in the economy and particularly infrastructure one is a bank led led model we have seen china actually using that or the capital market led model which america uses i think the discussion around the table we would agree i think mostly there is a consensus that we need domestic to step in domestic saving domestic participation by uh, domestic players uh, mr bhatia talked about the bank has got surplus balgo articulated very well in terms of the bond market uh, sanjay was very vocal in terms of you led the domestic lead and then foreign capital will actually follow uh, michael talked about uh, msme so this is definitely is something which it has to be led by the domestic we go back to 25 years when we started our career in the equity market uh, same thing happened even today uh, half of the floating uh, market cap um, is with india right so is is domestic capital so equity was also led by the domestic and then thereafter the foreign capital came in i guess we need to do that as one key takeaway the second and important point i think when i was looking at the construct of this panel i thought we couldn't have done anything better because it needed three distinct expertise uh, equity market expertise bond market expertise and the banking expertise and i have no idea how we could manage to get this thing together because in all of you we we found all the three commonality which is rare Uh, so thank you for sparing your time on saturday afternoon and the third and the final point is a, a big thank you to rashesh for moderating it excellently uh, as usual and uh, and president piki uh, for uh, hosting the session so thank you all enjoy the rest of the evening for the weekend thank you thank you thank you, thank you so much thank you so much thank you thank, thank you thank you, thank you uh, all the panelists um, just to remind all the viewers that we reassemble on monday december 14th at 9 am for the session with uh, an address by shri ravi shankar prasad honorable minister for law and justice communication and electronics and information technology government of india which is on leveraging ict for economic revival in the post covid 19 era that is monday at 9 am look forward to having you with us and once again to this very extremely interesting panel and each one bringing a different perspective thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the evening thank you very much thank you